Number one. My mom was traveling for work and sat next to a man on the plane. They had a casual conversation and exchanged business cards. Later that evening, she's in her hotel watching TV and gets a phone call from the front desk that her husband is here and they want to know if they can give him a key to the room. Turns out the creep on the plane was pretending to be her husband and trying to get into her room. Number two. I was traveling out of the country right after finishing up a huge five day work event where I had about 10 hours of sleep total during the five days. I got to the motel, which is kind of run down, and the carpet and blankets are damp, but I'm so exhausted I don't even really think about it. I fall asleep pretty much immediately at like 8 p.m. local time. At maybe 11 p.m. or so, I get a call from the motel phone saying there's been a complaint about noise. I tell them that's impossible. I've been sleeping. They ask me if maybe it's someone else in the room, and I tell them no. I'm here alone, so there's definitely no one else making any noise. They ask me again if I'm sure I'm by myself and not causing any noise. I say yes again and fall back asleep immediately. When I woke up and thought about it some more, I realized how weird the entire interaction was. There was absolutely no noise I could hear anywhere nearby, and I don't know why the motel staff would need me to clarify so many times that I was alone. Apparently, they never really called, so I assumed it must have been someone calling the different rooms to see who was in the rooms and how many people. I've never been so glad to always, always use the extra latch chain lock. Thank God I did. Number 3 While in the Isles of Scotland, we stayed in a and b It was owned by a couple. The bedrooms were extremely well done and beautiful but on everything there was signs to not touch. To use the shower you would have to ask the couple, and the internet ended at 11 p.m. The woman would also check on everyone at random times in the night. We would hear creeping in the hallway to make sure everyone was sleeping, and not doing any illegal things like using the internet. When we checked out of her B&B, she came into our room and said that we stunk, and then she opened the window to prove this, and demanded for money immediately. Another traveler had to go a check to pay for the room, and she took their bags and wouldn't give them back. But on the way out, she asked everyone if they enjoyed their stay. Number 4 We found a hotel in Yangon the day we got there for pretty cheap. They mentioned that the rates were low because maintenance was being done on several floors. We sleep fine, wake up, and head to breakfast. At breakfast, we met some Germans who had also stayed the night in our hotel. They said they had not slept well because during the middle of the night, someone woke them up to move them from the floor they were on. We, us and the Germans, found out later that they had been moved because they were on one of the levels reserved for maintenance, and part of the maintenance included gassing the rooms for bugs. During the middle of the night, they were just going around the room shoving the gas nozzle or whatever under the doors and just letting them run. Well, they wound up killing the two people next to the Germans before they realized they accidentally booked people on that floor. Thankfully, we weren't on that floor, but it's always stuck with me how seemingly easy it could have been to have gotten mixed up in that. Number 5 So, mine takes place in a London hostel a few weeks ago. I have two friends with me that are both male, and we're staying in a nine-bed mixed dorm. There's three sets of tier bunk beds. I'm in the bottom bed of the right bunk, friend one in the top of my bunk, and friend two in bottom bed of middle bunk. So we get in at 2 a.m. and all just quietly get in our beds. After a few minutes of lying there trying to sleep, I hear rustling behind me. So I think it's just someone going through their bag and I ignore it. Then I feel a hand on my hip over the cover. I turn around and it's a random guy telling me to move over and trying to pull at my cover. I initially thought he was drunk and wasn't sure which bed to be in, so I tell him to go find his own bed and then he shuffles away to the bottom bed of the left bunk. Well, then he comes back again. I again tell him to go back to his own bed and he shuffles back to his own yet again. This happens another couple of times with me gradually speaking louder and getting less polite, telling him to screw off. 
So I'm shaking because the situation is making me nervous, and I message my mate that's on the top bunk, saying I don't think I'm going to be able to sleep that night. He messages me back, casually thinking it's because of someone snoring. This is when I find out both of my mates have earplugs in, and although they've heard me speaking, they each thought I was speaking to the other friend. So I tell him the situation and he starts keeping an eye out. I hear the guy go to the bathroom that is in suite, but I can tell from the light he left the bathroom door open whilst doing so, and refused to look. My mate fills me in that the guy was walking around with his pants down and deliberately left the door open to get me to look. But either way, the guy goes back to his bed afterwards, and we think the situation is finally over. Then it happens again. My mate, keeping an eye out, shines his phone light on the floor and shouts for the guy to screw off. Apparently, he was crawling across the floor towards me. The guy suddenly takes offense at my mate's light shining on him and starts actually climbing the bunk ladder like King Kong to get to my mate on the top and was trying to take his phone. They start to wrestle for a while with my mate actually kicking the guy in the neck and trying to keep him away, only for the guy to swing backwards and come straight back at him yet again. I use this time to run for security who find the guy still hanging on the bed when they get there, then call the police and have the guy taken away in a riot van and banned from the building. Whilst the police had dragged him outside waiting for the riot van, the guy even headbutted the brick wall several times. No idea what the guy was on, but it definitely wasn't alcohol, but definitely on something to take a kick to the neck and still act like nothing happened afterwards. The guy kept trying to blame my mate when security came as well, saying things in broken English like, come up here and see how violent this guy is. My other mate that had slept through the whole incident kept saying the next day that he couldn't believe how friendly everyone in London is. That was before he knew what actually happened. Number 6 I arrived late at a hotel for a business trip. Flight had a malfunction so we had to land. They fixed it on the tarmac and we never deplaned. Room already paid for, confirmation number in hand, etc. I got there about 5 hours after I was supposed to be there. Of course, they gave away my room. I already wasn't happy from all the delays, and I wasn't going anywhere. The event I was there for was in their hotel. I wanted my room. I was polite but firm. They did some scrambling and asked if I would consider a damaged room under construction. As long as the sheets are clean so I can go to bed, I don't care. That was my reply. Big mistake. The room they gave me was literally a crime scene. The case had been closed so there was no legal issue to contend with, but someone had been killed, or nearly killed. Not 100% sure in that room. They had primed over the blood stains on the walls and ceilings, but had only taped down semi-clear plastic over the pooled blood on the carpets. Multiple small holes in the walls had obviously been patched and sanded, but there were multiple small holes in the walls. They gave me a completely new bed and TV from on-site inventory, so I was comfortable, but man, it was creepy as hell. The creepiest part was the priming job. It was so obviously blood splatter. You could see where the person had been hit and where they fell. You could also see how they had tried to get up and where they had finally collapsed. I'd like to add that this was in 1999. It was a StarTag flip phone. Very stylish back in the day. I usually wore it in a belt holster like Robin Williams in the movie Hook. I didn't call the hotel from the tarmac because I had very bad reception inside the plane. We landed at a small airport in Tennessee. I think it was called Myrna. Something like that. An ugly girl's name is all I remember it as. Cell towers weren't all that common back then, particularly away from the metro areas. I didn't call the hotel when we landed because the hotel was in the airport. Dallas, DFW. I wasn't traveling alone. I was on a later flight than a lot of people because I was part of the planning team. Huge meeting with blocks of rooms arranged for and paid for by my team well in advance of the event. I was made aware that there was renovations in progress, but I honestly didn't care. I had to be on stage presenting to large groups about five hours from the time I arrived. I had to get some sleep and have somewhere to shower and use the bathroom. I was given a new room the next day. 
I hadn't unpacked much and made sure I was 100% repacked before I went down to the meeting rooms. The hotel arranged to bring everything from murder room to non-murder room. I picked up new keys at the front desk. I would have loved to take some pictures, but I didn't have my camera. StarTac flip phones didn't have that function. Believe it or not, I'd never even considered the suicide option before someone else here brought it up. Looking back on it now, that may have been the case. I've been telling this story for close to 20 years. I'll raise that possibility from now on. I don't have any witnesses. It's just a very odd and unbelievably true story. And a very creepy one at that. This was pre-Google, pre-Trip Advisor, etc. The internet existed, obviously, but it was stuff like Rotten.com and E-Bombs World. Fun stuff. Not nearly what it is today. We actually had a planner on the team who booked rooms and space for meetings as something like half her job. Like a semi-professional travel agent. The PR angle would be scary today. I can just see the BuzzFeed clickbait generated by 100 iPhone pictures taken from odd angles. But no, that stuff didn't happen back then. I was very grateful that they pulled out a brand new mattress for me. I tipped everyone involved in that operation $10 two maintenance guys and one maid who was not in a maid uniform, some sort of sweatsuit. She made the bed while I brushed my teeth in the bathroom. She was happier with the $10 than the maintenance guys. They were grumpy. Like I said, this is one of the creepiest stories that have ever happened to me, and I plan to tell it for a long time to come. Number 7. When I was about four years old, my family ended up staying at the Cedar Lodge Motel where Gary Stainer worked right before he murdered four women. My family drove to Yosemite, and it was a long drive for us. By the time we arrived at the motel, it was late, we were all cranky, and we couldn't wait to get out. But at the moment we pulled in, something set my mom's teeth on edge, and she insisted that we left and found another hotel, reservation or not. My mom has always had like this sixth sense and her gut has actually saved us a couple of times. But my dad was tired and he managed to convince her to just ignore her gut and just stay for the night and the next morning we'd leave. I can remember my mom actually refusing to let go of our hands, making us stay right by her side as she kept looking around while checking in. To try and get her to relax, my dad suggested we go to the pool, thinking it would calm her down. Well, when we got there, there were no towels, so my mom called the front desk. The moment the man delivering towels arrived, my mom immediately grabbed us out of the water and rushed us back to the room. The man gave her the absolute creeps, and she says there was just this feeling of pure evil when he looked at us. That night, my mom and dad pushed the dresser in front of the door and had us all sleep in the same bed. The next morning, we left to go to another hotel, but my mom couldn't stop talking about how evil that motel was. About two months later, she and my dad were up late watching the news when they started reporting on a man who had murdered a woman and two young girls in Yosemite. Just as my mom began to say, how much you want to bet that it was that motel? They showed Carrie Stainer's face and it occurred at the Cedar Lodge Motel. Carrie Stainer was the man who brought us our towels at the pool. We've never gone back to Yosemite since and my mom is always insistent that we listen to our gut feelings. And when every bone in your body is telling you something is wrong, get the hell out. Number 8 My company would put us up in the Shiloh Inn downtown when we were in Salt Lake City. A co-worker of mine was awakened in the middle of the night by the sounds of a bunch of kids in the hallway. It went on for longer than he could tolerate, so he opened the room door to tell them to hush, only to find the hallway empty. He could still hear the children, so figuring they were in an adjoining room, he called down to the front desk to complain. The man at the front desk claimed to be certain there were no kids staying on that floor, but that he was certain the noise would subside in a bit. He offered to send up some earplugs. My coworker was a bit annoyed. How can you say there's no kids there when I'm hearing kids? But he went back to bed and eventually fell asleep. The next day when he was checking out, a different clerk made the mistake of asking the routine question. Was everything satisfactory with your stay? My coworker gave her an earful about the noisy kids and how the other clerk had dismissed his complaints. The clerk looked a little uncomfortable and said in a low voice, 
So we're not supposed to talk about our history with guests, but please do a Google search for Rachel David and you'll understand what happened to you. We get similar complaints every few weeks and we try to never put kids on that floor. In the van on the way to the airport, he read on his phone the story of how a mother, Rachel David, had tossed her seven children off the 11th floor balcony of the hotel, then called the International Dunes to their deaths before jumping herself. Number 9 While attending college, I went on a road trip with a good friend of mine to watch a sports team in a big game being played in Florida. We were huddling down the Florida Turnpike at 80 miles per hour, around 2 in the morning. I had a CB radio in my truck at the time, and tuned in to Channel 19, when out of the darkness, a voice from the radio then said, in the creepiest way possible, I didn't know you Tennessee boys could read a map. We responded with some nervous laughter. Turns out it was a trucker that saw us pass him as my buddy was looking at our map, trying to find some place for us to pull over and rest a bit and he noticed our Tennessee license plate. He was super helpful and told us there wasn't much around where we were, but there was a motel we could try up the road. We thanked him and headed that way. Getting off the exit and following his directions brought us to a motel that, I kid you not, looked exactly like the one from the movie Psycho. We went into the office, but there were no lights on, and it appeared to be empty. A quick walk down the handful of rooms yielded no more lights, people, other cars, or any signs of life in general. We went back into the office just to see if we had missed a sign or something, and I said very loudly, Hello? At that moment, a young guy that had been asleep on a cot behind the front desk got up and asked us what we needed. We said we wanted a room. He responded, Pick whichever one you want. They're all unlocked. We ended up picking one and had two queen beds. They appeared reasonably clean as far as motels go, but it was creepily outdated. The bathrooms were completely covered in old tile that was brownish green, and for some reason it reminded me of an old high school gym locker room. We took turns showering and tried to get a bit of rest, which ended up in us laying on top of the comforters on the beds since that seemed like the most hygienic thing we could do. We napped off and on for around an hour. Realizing that we weren't going to get any rest, we went back to talk to the guy in the office. After waking him up and telling him that after our showers we'd rather just head back out, we asked him how much we owed him. His response? Uh, I don't know. How about ten bucks? We paid the man and left. Weirdest and possibly cheapest lodging I think I've ever experienced. Number 10 This past Monday, my coworkers and I returned to our hotel from a day of work out in the field. Rebecca and I walked to our rooms and as we stood outside of our rooms, I opened mine and I saw someone in the bathroom. I said, hello? Nobody answered. My first instinct was that it was a cleaning lady in there for some reason, and then saw my bag with my clothes in her hands. I said to my coworker, there's a woman in my room. Then I asked the woman, What are you doing with my stuff? It gets a little fuzzy here because I can't remember everything I said and what she said, but she kept mumbling about how her key still worked and how it worked and that's how she got in. I was in shock and she was obviously very flustered having been caught mid-robbery. She dropped my bags and fumbled around with her purse and a white plastic bag. By this time my coworker was behind me watching all the insanity unfold. The woman was scrambling and walking towards the door and I said, What's in the bag? Thinking it's probably my stuff. And so she said, No, no, it's just my things. It's just my things. I'll show you. And so she did. I looked and I didn't see anything of mine. And so since I'm obviously in shock at this time, I let her leave. I went into my room and it's been ransacked. I did a quick look around to see if anything had been taken. All of my electronics were still there. Then I went into the bathroom and I saw my underwear, my bikini, and my clothes shoved into my own bags randomly. Even my passport was shoved in there. Then I looked on the counter and I saw that she got into my medication. I'm not sure what was going through my head at the moment other than I wanted it back, so I ran out the door to go find her. I ran to the laundry room downstairs and out the sides of the hotel, and I didn't see her. I realized I was never going to find her, so my coworker and I went down to the lobby and tell them what happened, and then we called the police. 
We went back up to my room to wait, and I noticed there's a metal bat on my bed, a little larger than one of those novelty wooden bats you can get at baseball games, but there's also a flashlight on the end. She must have left it behind in a hurry. She also left behind a necklace that must have fallen out of her bag when she was scrambling with mine. I was mostly freaking out at this point because I thought she had gotten away with my medication that I need. The police got there and took our statements and looked around the room as well. One thing that I noticed was that there were bits of drywall in the sink, and I pointed that out to the cops, but none of us really knew where it came from. We started looking at the door and the windows to see if she pried her way in somehow, but there was nothing. So we kind of just went with the idea that she had a spare key or something, even though the hotel front desk was adamant there was no way that could be. The officer that came brought two more officers as backup because they thought the woman might still be in the vicinity. But after our statements were taken, there was nothing else they could really do, so they left. I sat down to finally make some calls to tell people, and as I'm on the phone, I'm thinking about the drywall in the sink, and it still didn't make sense to me. So I'm on the phone, and I'm looking at the drywall and the mirror on the wall right above it, and then it hit me. I got my coworker, and I asked her to help me pull this mirror off the wall. We took down the mirror, and there's a hole there just big enough for a desperate junkie to squeeze right through. I asked Brian and Rebecca if I should call the cops again to let them know that I found this, and my boss said, there's still two cop cars in the parking lot. So I went down to tell them and the female cop kinda rolled her eyes, but the young guy said he'll come check it out. They both came back up, looked in the hole, and found a pillow, blanket, cigarettes, clothes, and toothbrushes. This woman had been living in the wall behind my mirror for god knows how long. She had access to me in my room at all times. One of the officers called the original officer to come back and take pictures of this. She explained to them what's going on and all I hear over the radio is, no freaking way. He comes back, takes pictures, and is just as mind blown as the rest of us. Obviously we packed up and left immediately. What's even crazier is she probably has been there for a long time. The last time we stayed at this hotel, I would randomly smell cigarette smoke, and I assumed someone was smoking in their bathroom, and it was traveling through the vents. But nope, it was just a junkie smoking on the other side of my mirror in the wall. She had access to other rooms as well. The holes in the walls were from a renovation, and the hotel hadn't properly patched and just covered up with mirrors. She could have been hanging out in other people's rooms as well when they were gone. Anyway, this was insane, and I'm taking a little time off. Hopefully I won't ever have to deal with someone living in my wall ever again. One can only hope. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's video. And if you have your own scary story that you'd like to share with me, make sure you send that to my email at southerncannibal at gmail.com. I'm always looking for more scary stories to bring to the channel. And before I bring this video to a close, I'd like to shout out all of my $5 or more patrons, as well as my $3 or more patrons featured on screen. Shout out to Babe Lincoln, Beth A, Kate E, Celeste S, Ellie S, Heather B, Howard R, Jacqueline W, Jazzy G, Jess, Jonathan C, Carrie F, Lori J, Lindsay S, Matthew B, Random Randy, Steph L, Tammy S, Terry H, and Emily W. Thank you all so much for supporting me on Patreon. And if any of you would also like to join these awesome people and also get a shout out and some other cool perks, be sure to head over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash southerncannibal. And once again, if you have your own story you'd like to send me, that's southerncannibal at gmail.com. Have a good one, everyone. And remember to always stay